Hi everybody and welcome to In Cold Blood reading one. I don't know what pages they're going to be because I'm going to do this in 15 minute chunks. That way you can decide and I'll, I'll post the pages in the, the YouTube title. So I'm just going to read for 15 minutes and then I'll let you know how many pages that was. So we're going to go on ahead and get started on in part one, the last to see them alive. Page three. The village of Holcomb stands on the high wheat plains of western Kansas, a lonesome area that other Kansans call out there. Some 70 miles east of the Colorado border, the countryside, with its hard blue skies and desert clear air, has an atmosphere that is rather more far west than middle west. The local accent is barbed with a prairie twang, a ranch hand nasalness, and the men, many of them, wear narrow frontier trousers, stetsons, and high-heeled boots with pointed toes. So more of like a Western vibe than a Midwest vibe. The land is flat and the, the views are awesomely extensive. Horses, herds of cattle, a white cluster of grain elevators rising as gracefully as Greek temples are visible along, visible long before a traveler reaches them. Holcomb too can be seen from great distances. Not that there is much to see, simply an aimless congregation of buildings divided in the center by the main line trains, tracks, sorry, of the Santa Fe Railroad, a haphazard hamlet bounded on the south by a brown stretch of the Arkansas River, on the north by, a high, by Highway Route 50, and on the east and west by prairie lands and wheat fields. After rain or when snowfalls thaw, the streets, untamed, unshaded, unpaved, turn from the thickest dust into the direst mud. At one end of the town stands a stark old stucco structure, the roof of which supports an electric sign, Dance. But the dancing has ceased and the advertisement has been dark for several years. Nearby is another building with an irrelevant sign, this one in flaking gold on a dirty window, Holcomb Bank. The bank closed in 1933 and its former counting rooms have been converted into apartments. It is one of the town's two apartment houses, the second being a ramshackle mansion known because a good part of the local school's faculty lives there as the teacher edge. But the majority of Holcomb's homes are one-story frame affairs with front porches. Down by the depot, the postmistress, a gaunt woman who wears a rawhide jacket and denims and cowboy boots, presides over a falling apart post office. The depot itself, with its peeling sulfur colored paint, it's equally, is equally melancholy. The chief, the super chief, the El Capitan, goes by every day, but these celebrated expresses never pause there. So remember, those are just trains that go through but never really stop because nothing really happens in Holcomb. No passenger trains do, only an occasional freight. Up on the highway, there are two filling stations, one of which doubles as a meagerly supplied grocery store, while the other does extra duty as a cafe. Hartman's Cafe, where Mrs. Hartman, the proprietress, dispenses sandwiches, coffee, soft drinks, and three-two beer. Holcomb, like the rest of Kansas, is dry. And that really is all. Unless you include as one must the Holcomb School, a good-looking establishment with reveal which reveals a circumstance that the appearance of the community otherwise camouflages, that the parents who send their children to this modern and ably staffed consolidated school, the grades go from kindergarten through senior high, and a fleet of buses transport the students, of which there are usually around 360, from as far as 16 miles away, are in general a prosperous people. Farm ranchers, most of them, they are outdoor folk, a very varied stock, German, Irish, Norwegian, Mexican, Japanese. They raise cattle and sheep, grow wheat, milo, grass seed, and sugar beets. Farming is always a chancy business, but in western Kansas, its practitioners consider themselves born gamblers, for they must contend with an extremely shallow precipitation. The annual average is 18 inches. And anguishing irrigation problems. However, the last seven years have been years of droughtless beneficence. Beneficence. Sorry, sometimes when you hear something out loud and you're in yours, you're like, is that the right word? It is. The farm ranchers in Finney County, of which Holcomb is a part, have done well. Money has been made not from farming alone, but also from the exploitation of plentiful natural gas resources, and its acquisition is reflected in the new school, the comfortable interiors of the farmhouses, the steep and swollen grain elevators. Until one morning in mid-November of 1959, few Americans, in fact few Kansans, had ever heard of Holcomb. 
like the waters of the river, like the motorists on the highway, and like the yellow train streaking down the Santa Fe tracks, drama in the shape of exceptional ha happenings had never stopped there. The inhabitants of the village, numbering 270, were satisfied that this should be so, quite content to exist inside ordinary life, to work, to hunt, to watch television, to attend social, school socials, choir practice, meetings of the 4-H club. But then in the earliest hours of that morning in November, a Sunday morning, certain foreign sounds impinged on the normal nightly Holcomb noises, on the keening hysteria of coyotes, the dry scrape of scuttling tumbleweed, the racing, receding wail of locomotive whistles, at the time, not a soul in Sleeping Holcomb heard them, four shotgun, bla shotgun blasts that, all told, ended six human lives. But afterward, the townspeople, therefore sufficiently unfearful of each other to seldom trouble to lock of each other to seldom trouble to lock their doors, found fantasy recreating them over and over again, those somber explosions that stimulated fires of mistrust in the glare of which many old neighbors viewed each other strangely and as strangers. The master of River Valley Farm, Herbert William Clutter, was 48 years old and as a result of a recent medical examination for an insurance policy, knew himself to be in first-rate condition. Though he wore rimless glasses and was of but average height, standing just under 5 feet 10, Mr. Clutter cut a man's man figure. His shoulders were broad, his hair had held its dark color, his square-jawed, confident face retained a healthy-hued youthfulness, and his teeth, unstained and strong enough to shatter walnuts, were still intact. We're getting lots of details on Mr. Clutter. He weighed 154, the same he had the day he graduated from Kansas State University, where he'd majored in agriculture. He was not as rich as the rich richest man in Holcomb, Mr. Taylor Jones, a neighboring rancher. He was, however, the community's most widely known citizen, prominent both there and in Garden City, the close-by county seat, where he had headed the building committee for the newly completed First Methodist Church, an $800,000 edifice. He was currently chairman of the Kansas Conference of Farm Organizations, and his name was everywhere respectfully or recognized among Midwestern agriculturalists, as it was in certain Washington offices, where he had been a member of the Federal Farm Credit Board during the Eisenhower administration. Always certain of what he wanted from the world, Mr. Clutter had in large measure obtained it. On his left hand, on what remained of a finger once mangled by a piece of farm machinery, he wore a plain gold band, which was the symbol, a quarter century old, of his marriage to the person he had wished to marry, the sister of a college classmate, a timid, pious, delicate girl named Bonnie Fox, who was three years younger than he. She had given him four children, a trio of daughters, then a son. The eldest daughter, Eviana, married, and the mother of a boy, Eviana, uh, blah, blah, blah. The eldest daughter, Eviana, married and the mother of a boy 10 months old, lived in northern Illinois but visited Holcomb frequently. Indeed, she and her family were expected within the fortnight, for her parents planned a sizable Thanksgiving reunion of the Clutter clan, which had its beginnings in Germany. The first immigrant Clutter, or Clotter, as the name was then spelled, arrived here in 1880. Truman, we really don't need to know that. Fifty-odd kinfolk had been asked, several of whom would be traveling from places as far away as Palatka, Florida. Nor did Beverly, the child next in age to Eviana, any longer reside at River Valley Farm. She was in Kansas City, Kansas, studying to be a nurse. Beverly was engaged to a young biology student of whom her father very much approved. Invitations to the wedding scheduled for Christmas week were already printed. Which left, still living at home, the boy Kenyon, who was at 15 taller than Mr. Clutter, and one sister a year older, the town darling, Nancy. In regard to his family, Mr. Clutter had just one serious cause for disquiet, his wife's health. She was nervous. She suffered little spells. Such were the sheltering expressions used by those close to her. Not that the truth concerning poor Bonnie's affliction was in the least a secret. Everyone knew she had been an on and off psychiatric patient for the last half dozen years. Yet even upon this shadowed terrain, su terrain sunlight had very lately sparkled. The past Wednesday, returning from two weeks of treatment at the Wesley Medical Center in Wichita, her customary place of retirement, Mrs. Clutter had brought, brought scarcely credible tidings to tell her husband. 
With joy, she informed him that the source of her misery, so medical opinion had at last decreed, was not in her head, but in her spine. It was physical, a matter of misplaced vertebrae. Of course, she must undergo an operation and afterward, well, she would be her old, her old self again. Was it possible? The tension, the withdrawals, the pillow muted sobbing behind closed doors, all due to an out of order backbone? If so, then Mr. Clutter could, when addressing his Thanksgiving table, recite a blessing of unmarred gratitude. Ordinarily, Mr. Clutter's mornings began at 6.30, clanging milk pails and the whispery chatter of the boys who brought them, two sons of a hired man named Vic Ursic, usually roused him, but today he lingered, let Vic Ursic's sons come and go, for the previous evening, a Friday the 13th, had been a tiring one, though in part exhilarating. Bonnie had resurrected her old self, as if serving up a preview of the normality, the regained vigor, soon to be. She had rouged her lips, fussed with her hair, and wearing a new dress, accompanied him to the Holcomb School, where they applauded a student production of Tom Sawyer, in which Nancy played Becky Thatcher. He had enjoyed it, seeing Bonnie out in public, nervous, but nonetheless smiling, talking to people, and they both had been proud of Nancy. She had done so well, remembering all of her lines and looking, as he had said to her in the course of backstage congratulations, just beautiful, honey, a real Southern belle. Whereupon Nancy had behaved like one, curtsying in her hoop skirt costume. She had asked if she might drive into Garden City. The State Theater was having a special 11.30, Friday the 13th, spook show, and all of her friends were going. In other circumstances, Mr. Clutter would have refused. His laws were laws, and one of them was Nancy and Kenyon, too, must be home by 10 on weeknights, by 12 on Saturdays. But weakened by the genial events of the evening, he had consented, and Nancy had not returned home until almost 2. He had heard her, her come in and had called to her, for though he was not a man ever really to raise his voice, he had some plain things to say to her, statements that concerned less the lateness of the hour than the youngster who had driven her home a school basketball hero, Bobby Rupp. Mr. Clutter liked Bobby and considered him for a boy his age, which was 17, most dependable and gentlemanly. However, in the three years she had been permitted dates, Nancy, popular and pretty as she was, had never gone out with anybody else. And while Mr. Clutter understood that it was the present national adolescent custom to form couples, to go steady and to wear engagement rings, he disapproved, particularly since he had not long ago by accident surprised his daughter and the Rupp boy kissing. He had then suggested that Nancy discontinue seeing so much of Bobby, advising her that a slow retreat now would hurt less than an abrupt severance later. For as he reminded her, it was a parting that must eventually take place. The Rupp family were, were Roman Catholics, the Clutters Methodist, a fact that should be in itself sufficient to terminate whatever fancies she and this boy might have of someday marrying. Nancy had been reasonable at any rate. She had not argued. And now, before saying goodnight, Mr. Clutter secured from her a promise to begin a gradual breaking off with Bobby. Still, the incident had lamentably put off his retiring time, which was ordinarily 11 o'clock. As a consequence, it was well after 7 when he awakened on Saturday, November 14th, 1959. His wife always slept as late as possible. However, while Mr. Clutter was shaving, showering, and outfitting himself in whip, rip, cor, rip, whip, cord trousers, very hard for me to say for some reason, a cattleman's leather, leather jacket and soft stirrup boots. He had no fear of disturbing her. They did not share the same bedroom. For several years, he had slept alone in the master bedroom on the, on the ground floor of the house, a two-story, 14-room frame and brick structure. Though Mrs. Clutter stored her clothes in the closets of this room and kept her, her few cosmetics and her myriad medicines in the blue tile and glass brick bathroom adjoining it, she had taken for serious occupancy Aviana's summer bedroom, or former bedroom, which, like Nancy's and Kenyon's rooms, was on the second floor. The house, for the most part, designed by Mr. Clutter, who therefore proved himself a sensible and said it if, said it, if not notably decorative architect, had been built in 1948 for $40,000. The resale value is now $60,000. Situated at the end of a long lane-like driveway shaded by rows of Chinese elms, the handsome white house standing on an ample lawn of groomed Bermuda grass impressed Holcomb. It was a place people pointed out. 
As for the interior, there were spongy displays of liver-colored carpet intermittently abolishing the glare of varnished, resounding floors. An immense modernistic living room which covered in nubby fabric interwoven with glitterly, glitter, glittery strands of silver metal. A breakfast alcove featuring a banquette upholstered in blue and white plastic. That sounds really ugly. This sort of furnishing was what Mr. and Mrs. Clutter liked, as did the majority of their acquaintances, whose homes, by and large, were similar, similarly furnished. Other than a housekeeper who came in on weekdays, the Clutters employed no household help, so since his wife's illness and the departure of the elder daughters, Mr. Clutter had of necessity learned to cook. Either he or Nancy, but principally Nancy, prepared the family meals. Mr. Clutter enjoyed the chore, and it was excellent at it. No woman in Kansas baked a better loaf of salt-rising bread, and his celebrated coconut cookies were the first item to go at charity, bake, char charity cake sales. But... He was not a hearty eater. Unlike his fellow ranchers, he even preferred a Spartan, preferred Spartan breakfasts. So this ends on the top of page 10, and I'll keep reading in a little bit, a little bit later.